at the same time that Sherry was uh, in, uh, in office, there was a Canada World Youth Exchange with Trinidad and Tobago. And she and I had both signed up to be host families. And we learned that when the Trinidadians came to Edmonton and they had a, little, a few days together, they were picking who, which, which host family they wanted to go to. We found out they were fighting over the lesbians. They all wanted to stay with the lesbians because there's a Canadian counterpart paired up with everybody, and it was a cultural thing for them too, <laughs> which is fantastic. <laughs> Hello, my friends. Welcome to my channel, Mindy's Magpie Reads. If you're new here, a special welcome to you. I'm Lindy. I read a lot of books and that's mostly what I talk about on this channel and I also talk about other things going on in my life. I am going to include timestamps with links to directly take you to all six books that I'm going to be talking about today, the six books I finished in the past week, and also just the other stuff which is going to be at the beginning. Normally, I would be recording outside, and it is a gorgeous day out there, but there are so many mosquitoes. This morning, I went out to gather a few herbs, and I got several mosquito bites, and then I took a little bit of footage of the garden so that I can show you what it looks like. I will put that at the end, at the very end of this video, if you want to stick around for that. But again, more mosquito bites. So sitting outside for an hour recording this, <laughs> I would just be covered in mosquito spray and I don't like to do that. And uh, by the way, it does often take me about 45 minutes to an hour to finish up with 20 or 30 minutes worth of video. So I cut out a bunch of stuff just to save you time. <laughs> I really appreciate that you're spending your time watching me talk about books and things. So first off I want to tell you about the lesbian history tour that I led on July 1st with the talented Michelle Lavoy. You will have heard a short clip at the very beginning. My contributions were a lot of anecdotal type memories and Michelle had facts and figures and full names of people and I think we made a really good pair. The turnout was fantastic. We had I think 42 people on the tour which meant that every time we crossed a street we often would have to wait for a second light so that the entire crowd could cross. The weather mostly held out until the very end and we had a downpour uh, and we were in a spot where we could huddle in the entryway of a building and those people who didn't fit had umbrellas. They were standing outside. Uh, it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And as I was preparing for it uh, in the a couple months leading up to it, uh, it brought up a lot of memories from the 80s and the 90s when I used to be young. <laughs> Another thing that I did this week was I went to an outdoor music and poetry event. My sweetie, Lori McFadden, was reading from a piece that had been chosen for an online anthology of Edmonton writers. Actually her piece in there is a short piece of fiction. But she had 15 minutes so in addition to that piece she also read from her most recent poetry book Walking Through Turquoise. I will link information to that book and the reading series in case you're in Edmonton and you want to come to more of them. It's in Rainbow Valley, which is a little ski hill right within the city of Edmonton, and behind the stage was the ski hill, and as one of the readers was reading, I think she was, her piece was about buffalo, 
there were a couple of coyotes crossing high up on the hill. Yeah, wildlife in the city, it's a thing. No bison, though. You have to go to the Elk Island National Park, which is about 45 minutes outside of Edmonton, to see a herd of bison. Oh yeah, and I had the opportunity to wear my new patchwork trousers that I talked about, I think last week or the week before, to the reading series. So this is what they look like. We had a lot of socializing going on this past week. So I had the opportunity to make cake and still working through, you are human and you need cake. And the recipe I made was the sunken apple or plum cake. But in my case, I used blueberries. It's blueberry time right now. Also Saskatoon time. I've been picking a whole bunch of Saskatoons and freezing them. Uh, my trees are just loaded this year. If you're not familiar with Saskatoons, they have a, a distinctive flavor, a combination of pear and almonds and maybe blueberry a little bit too. They're yummy. We hosted the monthly literary salon uh, and um, our friends brought cakes as well. Uh, so much good food, <laughs> cakes, celebrations, and we listen to poetry and fiction being read out loud and literary salons are great. And the craft thing that I did this past week was flower pounding. So this bandana that I'm wearing, I don't know if you can see, it is yellow marigold petals and some leaves from my garden. Here's another one that I did with more of a variety of flowers on it. Really happy with how that turned out. And now I've got other friends coming to do flower pounding in my garden. This is the time for it. And if you're wondering, these designs should be permanent on here because I have pre-treated the cloth with a mordant. I used an alum mordant. If you're curious about that sort of thing, we can talk about that in the comments field down below. Okay, so on to the books. The first one that I'm going to tell you about, I did not like. I read it all the way through to the end because it was chosen for my feminist book club. I'm talking about Book Woman of Troublesome Creek by Kim Michelle Richardson. Now, on Goodreads, this one has got a really high rating. It's not to my taste. And as a matter of fact, nobody in my particular book club really cared for it either. Uh, I don't feel like I always have to read a book all the way through for book club, but in this case, the writing bugged me so much that it was <laughs> like I derived a certain amount of pleasure from pouncing on all of the examples of why I hated it. And I will give you some examples too. So actually, before I read from it, I should tell you what it's about. It's set in the mountains of Kentucky in 1936, and it is based on two true historical facts. One is that there was a uh, pack horse librarian program going on where uh, women and some men would take mules or horses up into the hills to distribute reading material to remote uh, hill families. And the other thing is that there was a family in Kentucky who looked blue, their skin was blue, because of a congenital blood condition. And the central character, Bluett, has that condition. I had heard of the blue people of Kentucky previously from the book um, Blue Skin Gods by Sindhu. 
anyway, uh, we have Bluett, who is 18 years old, and she's got a job as a pack horse librarian. Uh, but her pa, who's a miner, a coal miner, wants to get her married off because he knows he's not going to live long. He's got a lung condition from working in the coal mine. And, hey, yeah, so there's that going on. In this section, uh, Bluett meets a man that you can tell right away that this is going to be a love interest, a, a romance aspect of the story. The whole book is written from Bluett's point of view. Our eyes latched and I couldn't turn away. His were fine and spirited, yet there weren't nothing playful in them. There was something deeper, a touch of chance and danger, a conquering, but no harming in his gaze either. No fear I could rightly claim from it or could summon or feel the need to tamp, to turn from. His eyes held a muddle of curiosity, loss, and other distant things I couldn't call up that had somehow taken root and fixed themselves to him in a strange way. The first time I read that, I laughed so hard, I almost fell on the floor. Bluett's mother has died, and here we see how much the author loves to use adjectives. How I ached for her, recalling her head bent to candlelight, her slender fingers dipping into beeswax to coat the thread to strengthen tired old string, her swift, graceful hands working stitches into the fabric, her sharp teeth biting snips of thread, her nimble fingers knotting while I sat at her feet watching her rhythms birth a hymn sweeter than any bird song. And then there are sections where the author is using dialogue to show how much she knows about old uh, Kentucky folk remedies. So we have a woman in the hills who is asking for more uh, woman's home companion. And uh, a sorry ma'am, not today. I'll look for one at the center first thing back, I said. So I really like the way that she's always keeping track of what her clients in the hills, what kind of reading material they want. So this woman who's asking for Woman's Home Companion says, Be obliged to get one. Nestor Riley's been reading it, and she told me in passing last year she ain't rubbed groundhog brains on her baby's sore teeth or needed to use the hen innards on the gums of her teething ones since. And after she'd read about a good paste recipe that cured thrush, Nestor said, none of her nine young'uns ain't ever had to drink water from a stranger's shoe again to get the healing. Yep. And one more. So much melodrama. I climbed into bed beside Angeline and the sleeping babe. Curling up next to their bodies, I cradled my arm across them both and wept, howled, a dry howl, an empty riverbed droughted from heartache, hurts, and hardships, till the sobs rent the hollows, the deep rock caverns of my soul, and brought forth rivers of agony. Sorry, if you like this book, uh, I don't mean to disparage your taste. Uh, that's fine. Everybody has their own taste, but definitely not a book for me. Next up is a graphic novel that I read in ebook format. I got it through my library's Hoopla app. It's When Everything Turned Blue by Alessandro Baronciani. It's translated from Italian by Carla Roncalli di Montorio. It's a short little story about a woman who develops an anxiety disorder and she has panic attacks. The illustrations are entirely in a dark blue color and the artist has used lines 
for shading. You can see here how he does that with lines and cross hatching. The young woman is taking a rescue remedy. She is going to a bunch of medical appointments to try and figure out what's happening to her heart. How come it keeps beating so fast? Uh, but when she finally learns that it is panic attacks, she's able to finally deal with that in a way that can help her cope with what's going on. Next up is a memoir, Fieldwork, by Elena Regan. It's subtitled A Forager's Memoir. And Regan is a lesbian. She's a chef who moved with her wife, Anna, into the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where they live way in the backwoods in a cabin that had originally been built as a luxury hunting lodge. And they've turned it into a business where people come for the weekend to experience uh, being in the forest, but also gourmet cooking with a lot of locally foraged herbs and berries and uh, fish from the river and other agricultural products from nearby farmers. The audiobook is read by the author and she also has an anxiety disorder. She's honest about her alcohol addiction and she goes back and forth between current times because shortly after they got this business set up, the pandemic started, which Yes, so they're living in the backwoods during the pandemic. Only during the spring, summer, and fall and the winters they spend in Chicago. Anyway, Regan has an amazing memory of what it was like to be very young, like five years old. A lot of her memories date back all the way to then. She was the fourth girl in the family, but her siblings were all in their teens when she was born. So she was very much uh, an afterthought. And her parents were really wanting a boy. And she herself said she always felt like she was a boy. So her father got a son through her. She says, I've told you my mom pierced my ears before I was old enough to protest because as a baby, people thought I was a boy. People thought I was a boy even when mom dressed me in pink. I had a boy's aura. I was androgynous without meaning to be. I recently read Elliot Page's memoir and in that memoir, Page talks about how much he identified with the movie E.T. And that one Halloween, he went as Elliot from the movie with the red hoodie. And then in Regan's memoir, she writes, uh, when she's talking about dealing with insomnia as a child, that she would imagine hunting mushrooms. This is something that she loved to do with her dad. I knew I would wear my red hoodie like Elliot wore in E.T. I wanted to be just like Elliot, just as lucky just as sad. I was determined to wear that red hoodie until it became threadbare. So I just found that an inter interesting bit of serendipity. A couple of queers with a strong identification with that character Elliot in the movie E.T. Did I mention Regan also has an anxiety disorder? At one point she said she decided to write down a fear inventory because if I wrote it down, then maybe the fears would go away or lessen. And then she goes on to enumerate them all. Her writing is very poetic at times. And there's so much talk about uh, wild plants and especially mushrooms, but all kinds of wild plants and how she prepares them um, not only fresh, but also pickling and making vinegars and drying and powdering and um, all kinds of fancy stuff like that. And ooh, just sounds so delicious. And I find 
listening to that kind of audiobook very relaxing and soothing and her voice is also quite soothing so that was that was good it was really good so speaking of eating the next audiobook I want to tell you about is called How to Be Eaten, and it's by Maria Edelman. The audiobook is read by Lauren Ezel. Uh, this is a, quite a different sort of story. It's fiction. It's set in New York City, where five women are meeting every week in a group therapy session because they're all dealing with trauma, so personal trauma of various types but all of them, their stories hit the news. So they're public figures. And each woman's story correlates with a traditional fairy tale. You can see on the cover, Little Red Riding Hood is one of the stories. There's uh, a Cinderella and a Bluebeard, Rumpelstiltskin, uh, Hansel and Gretel. Uh, it's just deliciously done, uh, funny and dark, very smart. Uh, so there are supernatural elements, but the issues facing women today are very much the central theme of this audiobook, and I found it really enjoyable. My next two books are both five-star reads, so saving the best for last. Got another graphic novel. This one is The High Desert by James Spooner. It's a heavy one, so I'm going to put it down. Spooner is of mixed ancestry. His mother is white, his father is African-American, and he was growing up in Apple Valley, California, which is in the desert, small place. In between chapters, there are two page spreads of landscape, so you really get a feel for the place. And this mostly covers his early to late teen years, where he got into the punk culture. In the author information at the back, I learned that James Spooner is best known for his seminal documentary, Afropunk, and for co-creating the Afropunk Festival. His parents divorced when he was um, still quite young. His father was a philanderer who had a whole series of marriages, so he lived with his white mother. There were just a few other black kids at school and there was also a strong white supremacy presence in town. So the connections between skinheads and how that culture shifted into neo-Nazi white supremacy uh, was enlightening to me as well as more information about punk culture in the late 80s when this book is set. There's often lyrics from punk songs and they arc across the page in a way that uh, shows how the music was really part of his growing up years. So James and his friend Ty and this other guy Ethan all form a punk band. And Ethan's older brother, George, is really scary with the white supremacy stuff. And James is having a conversation with Ty, who's his black friend, about his fear of being around George. And then there's additional text here and there with James as an adult adding commentary. So here the text says, 
Even as adults, experiencing prejudice is unavoidable. We can't hide from racist coworkers, customers, business owners, elected officials, and so on. We have always had to make choices around when we speak up and when we bite our tongues. Though part of me feared this was an elaborate prank, ending with my corpse being dumped in the desert. I stayed quiet the rest of the ride. It hadn't occurred to me that most people don't have to contemplate the potential for homicide in new friendships. Questions were brewing. Questions our country still grapples with. Ironically, blackness has always shed light on how whiteness has been catastrophic. A hefty memoir. There's a lot to it. I loved it. And finally, the best book that I've read in the past week, it's called Truth Telling, Seven Conversations About Indigenous Life in Canada. It's a series of essays by Michelle Good. And the ep epigraph, which is by John Trudell, the activist, and recording artist, poet, really captures the essence of this collection. When one lives in a society where people can no longer rely on the institutions to tell them the truth, the truth must come from culture and art. So there are, are essays about residential schools, about broken promises, uh, racism, foster care, pretendians, land back. In that section, she writes, there's no such thing as crown land. It is all indigenous land. And oh, also there's one on uh, indigenous literatures. Last year, I read Daniel Heath Justice's Why Indigenous Literatures Matter, which is excellent, but this kind of condenses it all into a much shorter essay. The book itself is only 230 pages long, something like that. The audiobook is four hours. It's read by Megan Tooley, by the way. But if you're, you're looking for something condensed that covers both history and contemporary issues surrounding Indigenous peoples and Canadian peoples in our interactions, I highly, highly recommend this. Um, Marilyn Maya Mendoza asked me to recommend something about residential schools chapter in there will really give you a good grounding in what's, what was going on then. I love when I find books that I say, every Canadian needs to read this. Just excellent. Really high quality. And that's it. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for watching. And please say hello to me down in the comments. Let me know if there's any aspect of this video that really appealed to you. I'd love to hear that. And just tell me about yourselves. I'd like to know who's watching. And I know I have regular people that come back every week and I'm always happy to see you say hi and what's going on. It's part of what makes BookTube a wonderful community this interaction going on down in the comments. So thanks again, and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.